Right here, we got one, got one. You got one? Yeah, yeah, look at this. All right, Dr. Okada, move in for the catch. A thick cloud of lore has hung for centuries over the densely forested mountains of Japan. Stories that spoke of creatures living and lurking within the shadows of the trees and deep beneath its flowing rivers. Yet as is often the case with lore and its tendency to be passed from storyteller to storyteller, the truth behind the tale is often skewed and quite frequently misunderstood. The Tatori Prefecture proudly hails as being one of the most remote stretches of wilderness in all of Japan. Breathtaking is the beauty that defines this wild place, and we are honored to step foot on these sacred grounds. Today, the brave wilderness team and I will be breaking trail for an adventure unlike any we have embarked upon before, as we join the world's leading authority in Japanese giant salamander research and conservation, Dr. Sumio Okada, also known as Okada Sensei. For over two decades, Okada Sensei has been tirelessly working to protect these fragile amphibians, whose breeding grounds are under the constant threat of habitat degradation due to the building of dams and embankment protection walls. The Japanese giant salamander is the second largest amphibian in the world and is considered a living fossil, as their biology has barely changed in millions of years. This, along with their cryptic nature, has shrouded them in a cloak of mystery, and you will soon understand why they have been revered as river dragons. Wow, you can feel the energy in the air within this forest. It is ancient, and the animals that live here, these Japanese giant salamanders, are about as prehistoric as it gets. I'll tell you what, guys, the salamanders are out there. So as we get closer to sunset, we're gonna gear up and head out at night. As you know, these amphibians are nocturnal, so our best chance of coming across them will be under the cover of darkness. Finding river dragons is not impossible under the light of day, yet it's their nocturnal feeding habits that make them much more likely to emerge from their dens at night. All right, guys, well, this is the spot. Dr. Okada says this is where we're getting into the river. We're gonna head upstream and hopefully find some giant salamanders. All right, lead the way. With Okada Sensei leading us forward, the glow of our flashlight beams cut through the darkness and the search for salamanders was underway. In nearly every episode featured on the Brave Wilderness channel, I have been the one who is expected to safely catch our target species. Yet with the giant salamander, that will not be the case. Due to their vulnerable status and cultural importance to the Japanese people, these amphibians are considered a special national monument by the Japanese government. Strict laws and licensing means only Okada Sensei and other licensed researchers are able to catch and handle giant salamanders in the wild. My job will be to spot and assist in recording data if one is found. I'll tell you what, guys. You wander away from the rest of the group and just spread out by yourself searching. And I just can imagine what it would be like hundreds of years ago to come across one of these creatures for the first time. You could certainly see where all the lore and the myth would have come from. These incredible, enormous river dragons just out here in the darkness hunting amongst the current. Ah, it's exciting to be out here and hopefully we're gonna find a big one. Even with waders keeping our clothes dry, the chill of the water was enough to send consistent shivers down our spines. Yet the thrill of the search and the hope of encountering a true giant kept us all fighting forward. Then suddenly, as if manifested from silt and shadow, there in the ripple of broken fragments of light, the silhouette of a dragon materialized. Wait, 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 right here. Right here, we got one, got one. You got one? Yeah, yeah, look at this. Yeah, okay. Look at that perfect ambush behavior right there just waiting down current with its head pointed in towards the middle of the river. Now, if a fish or a crab comes by, it's capable of just gulping it straight down into its gullet. Now, if I can take just a minute before we catch it, what I wanna do is actually just slink down in the water here with the GoPro on a little light. Let's go ahead and 
drop those lights down lower. Is that okay for your camera? Yeah, okay, let's try that. And I wanna see if I can get some shots of it just naturally right there in its environment. Oh, this is great. All right, it's just holding its ground right now. It definitely can sense that we are here. And I'm able to get right up close to it. Oh, that is so cool. Wow. That's a good one. That is a good sized salamander. What an ancient looking creature. All right, Dr. Okada, move in for the catch. Yes. Man, I got a pretty awesome shot right there. You got it? Whoa. Got it. Man, nice. they could be quick. Wow, look at that. Completely fills the inside of the net. Each salamander is unique and we have to collect the biometric data for every one that we find. So let's get it up here on shore and uh, sure. get what we need. All right guys, now before we collect the biometric data of the salamander, what I wanna do, because this one is so big, is place it inside of this container so we can take an up close look at its really cool features. Now, this will allow you guys to get a better look and of course, us the opportunity to admire it. All right, let's go ahead and get the salamander in there. Oh, this is gonna be cool. You guys got good shots? Yep. Here we go. Wow. The Japanese giant salamander. Have you ever seen an amphibian of that size? It's so big, it almost doesn't fit in the container. Now, notice the shape of the salamander's head. It's wedge-shaped, it's big, it's flat. That allows them to cut through the current and certainly wedge themselves underneath rocks where, of course, they build their dens. And what's very distinct about this salamander as compared to the hellbender is look at all these fleshy little nodules on the head. We didn't see that with the hellbender. And I'm guessing, and Dr. Okada, correct me if I'm wrong, those are sensory organs, right? Mm -hmm. To help them feel around in their environment, sense chemicals, because as you can see, they have very small eyes, very poor eyesight. So they primarily rely on their chemical receptors to help them navigate their environment. Now, as you move your way down the length of the amphibian's body, you'll notice these flaps of skin, right? It looks very wrinkly. Those flaps are actually capable of helping them exchange gases within the water. Basically, this is a way for them to breathe when they're completely submerged. As we know, a lot of amphibians absorb their environment or absorb oxygen in through their skin, and the Japanese giant salamander is a perfect example of an amphibian that uses its skin to breathe. Now, you notice the length between the front legs and the rear legs has quite a noticeable spread, right? That allows them to keep their body really low and squat to the basin of the river. Now, each one of these arms, and of course the legs are very short and stumpy, but they are armed with little pads on their fingertips. They have four fingers up front, five fingers in the back, and those little nuptial pads, they're almost peach in coloration, allow them to grip to the basin of the river. Dr. Okada, can we take a look at the salamander's toes. Let's show those little nuptial pads, maybe on the back foot here. If you can just sort of lean that foot up for Mario's camera there. See if we can look at those pads. You guys see that? Go ahead and zoom oh, yeah. in there. Now you'll notice that the feet are not really webbed like a frog, right? There's a little bit of webbing, it looks like, at the just where the toes connect to the foot. But those pads are really what they rely on to help them move through the environment. They can pretty much lock in place no matter how powerful the current. I noticed that there's like a little divot, a couple divots in the tail. Is that where it's maybe something tried to eat it or bite it? Yeah, bit it. Mm -hmm. uh, something hit the stone. Okay, so maybe a, a potential predator bit at this. Of course, males will also fight with each other to protect breeding territories. Or of course, as we know, the male Japanese giant salamander is oftentimes considered the den master. They look after the eggs and after the larva. So, of course, this salamander would be defending its young if something tried to come in and consume the babies. Now, what's really cool is that when we walked up on the salamander, it was in the process of hunting. And to me, that's one of the most impressive features of this creature is the fact that it will lay in wait in an ambush position and then they have that enormous mouth. It, their jaws spread all the way far back so they can just gulp something up straight out of the water, whether it's a crayfish or a crab, a frog, or sometimes they will even eat other salamanders. So in a sense, this amphibian can be cannibalistic. If it's a smaller Japanese giant salamander, it stands the chance of becoming a meal. 
All right, well, I would say at this point, we're probably ready to collect the biometric data. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna bring in the measuring tube here. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Okada is going to pick the salamander up. We're gonna put it in there and collect this important research. The same protocol is followed for each and every salamander. As the length is carefully recorded, the weight is accurately checked, and the slippery amphibian is scanned to determine whether or not it was previously tagged. This gentle giant was already in the record books, so its biometrics will be updated, and the good news is that it appears healthy and happy. Further confirmation that this remote population, for now, is continuing to thrive. Well, we have collected all the necessary biometric data and it is time to release the salamander back into the wild. Dr. Okada, thank you so much for leading this expedition tonight. How awesome was this, guys, heading into the back country of Japan to get up close with the one and only Japanese giant salamander. For millions of years, these mysterious creatures lived and thrived within these ancient waters. The legends of countless stories and the keepers of the river spirit. Yet in less than a century, the realm of river dragons has nearly been wiped out. The future of the Japanese giant salamander is unknown, and sadly the probability of it becoming extinct is a very real threat due to the negative effects of human activity. If the nesting sites of these beautiful amphibians continue to be destroyed, with the building of dams and embankment protection walls, their fate is all but written in the concrete that is yet to be poured. For Okada-sensei, the fight to educate the public and protect the giants and their habitats that do still remain is never ending. Yet hope shines brightly as the work he so passionately enjoys is already being passed down and honored by his son with open arms and smiles of excitement. If you would like to make a difference in protecting the Japanese giant salamander, and also dream of seeing these beautiful animals in the wild for yourself, make sure to visit the website that is helping to ensure that there's a future in the realm of river dragons. The giant salamander is considered a special national monument by the Japanese government. And for centuries, it has lurked in the shadows of myth and lore. Ranking as the second largest salamander species in the world, they can grow to lengths of nearly five feet, classifying them as monstrous in the world of amphibians. The Brave Wilderness team and I had the incredible honor of working alongside renowned salamander expert, Dr. Sumio Okada, and we traveled deep into the wilds of the Totori Prefecture to find and collect biometric data on these elusive river dragons. Wait, wait, wait. Come right here. Right here, we got one, got one. Wow, look at that. Have you ever seen an amphibian of that size? Due to their vulnerable status and strict licensing, only Okada Sensei was allowed to catch and handle the wild specimens. Yet when it comes to giants in captivity, the regulations are a bit more flexible. Today we are visiting the Hanzaki Research Institute of Japan. For over a decade, their mission has been to research and help to ensure the survival of the Japanese giant salamander. In the field, I did my best to learn all I could from Okada Sensei. My diligence toward being a good student in the art of giant salamander research ultimately earned my teacher's trust and I was given the invitation to assist in the yearly data collection for the Institute's oldest, largest, and most cherished salamander, the great Osanchiro. All right, so Okada-sensei said, wait right here. He's going up there into the enclosure to check on the salamander. Now, this is one of the largest Japanese giant salamanders ever found that is currently on record. He tells me it is absolutely enormous. It's going to dwarf anything that we saw in the field. I'm super excited, I can barely contain myself right now because I'm gonna be able to get hands on with this animal to help with the measurements. So the role is gonna sort of be reversed here. I'm gonna be collecting the measurements. Okada Sensei is going to be writing them down. Are you guys ready for this? We are going to see one of the largest Japanese giant salamanders ever seen. Let's do it. Let's go. 
Oh no, he just holds the weight right here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm like jumping out of my skin right now. All right, ready? Good. All right. We're ready. Let's do it. Let's do it, guys. Oh man. You guys nervous? I don't know, I'm excited. Following in the footsteps of my teacher, we ascended a flight of stairs and entered the paddock of this ancient creature. Its fenced and fortified containment area wasn't necessarily designed to keep the salamander in, but instead was designed to keep any potential predators out. Now, Okada Sensei has quarantined the biggest one down in one enclosure for us so it's easier to find, easier for us to catch and collect the biometric data. So it's in this one. You see it? Oh, right there, look at that. Look, that's its nose sticking out. Whoa, hold on. Get a shot, get a shot. Uh, that is a giant salamander. All right, so what we're gonna do is actually enter into the enclosure. We'll peel back these boards, gently get the salamander out into the open water. Uh, we're gonna have to get it into a net and then up here to collect the biometric data, but we'll spend a couple minutes there inside the enclosure to sort of look at some of its features and just be in awe of what this creature is. Come around like this. Right, I'll, let you, I'll let you go in first. I'm gonna leave my pack up here, guys. All right. All right, guys, I'm going in. Okay, careful. Getting into the water. Woo, that is cold. That is some cold water. All right, here, hand me your camera. Oh boy. Here you go, Mario. Woo! Before we get the salamander out of there, let me see if I can get a shot of it with the GoPro just hunkered down here. So it's right under here, right? Here. Okay. Now let's try to move really, really slowly so that we don't muddy the water. We want to try to keep it as clear as possible. Right. I'm going to have to just go, sort of just go blind on this here. And hopefully the camera is picking up the salamander. You can see. It's definitely there's moving backwards more than the tail's coming up the back. A lot of debris in there. Oh, 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 I see it. You're right. It is starting to come up the back. Well, maybe we're getting a shot. Tough to tell. There it is, it's right it's actually, there. It's actually backing out the whole thing. Oh my goodness, it is huge. That is just its tail. Its tail is like the size of a canoe paddle. This is the largest amphibian I have ever seen in my life. It's time to reveal the beast. You ready? I, I do. You do the rocks? Yeah, and the you. I'll get the boards? Board. Okay. Guys, this is something that is done once a year, removing the salamander from the breeding paddock to collect its biometric data. This is a very special day, an incredible honor for all of us to be a part of this process. This is it. Are you ready? This is it, yeah. I'm trying to not disturb the silt. Whoa. Look at that. Are you kidding me? Look at the size of that thing. There's the head, there's the head. Look at it, it's the size of a cantaloupe. Whoa, my goodness, that is a monstrous salmon. It's so much bigger than I thought. Oh, wait, there's two. Yeah, there's a smaller one in here. A smaller one in here, there's another one over here, but that is the big guy. I got a sensei, so what's the best plan from here? Is it okay for me to go in and bring the salamander around to this side? Yeah, um, and catch. Uh, okay. Okay, got it, thank you. Now here's a question, before we get it in the net, can you bring it up here and can I slightly lift it to reveal it for the camera? Yeah. Yeah, okay, before we put it in the net, because once yeah, it's in the net, it'll be really hard to see. I'm gonna actually move this smaller one into the next tube here. Come here, buddy. Oh, it is so unique feeling. There you go, you go in here. Oh. Wow. This is the first contact I have made with one of these salamanders. It is incredible. Come on, big guy. There we go. Okay. Slowly coax him down through here. There we go. Wow, look at that. An absolute giant. What an ancient creature. A living fossil. This animal is well over a hundred years of age. Look at how cool that thing is. 
Can you believe that? Look at it. Whoa. Oh, he's so slimy. Impossible to hold on to. That's why we have to use a dip net to actually get it out of here. Not only is it strong, but it's also incredibly slippery. All right, so we're gonna gently, there we go. Oh, slide down into that net. Okay, the salamander is safely inside of the dip net. So I'm gonna go up and uh, Okada-sensei is gonna pass the giant up to me. Oh, heavy. Got it? Okay, yep. Whoa. Got him, got him, got him, got him, got him. Yep, good, good, good. Whoa, it is strong. It is heavy. Wow. All right, that is me cradling a Japanese giant salamander. Tail first. Head first. Head first. Okay, so that this, does it, oh, this end opens up. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I do have to be careful that I'm not bitten. They do have extremely sharp teeth, and this is a very large animal. So I have to gently get this opened up, and then he will slide out this end. Right, here we go. Look at that. Whoa. Look at that giant. Hi, buddy. Okay. Wow. Okay, get my hand underneath the jaw. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna gently slide it down here, Okada Sensei so we can fully reveal the salamander. There we go, so slippery. The layer of mucus that coats their bodies is, it's just like, you see that? It's like snot. Now we want to put as little stress on the creature as possible. We're gonna quickly collect the biometric data, uh, get a couple of cool shots, and then release it right back into the enclosure. But let's just take one second to admire the design of this animal's body. Look at how wide it is. Look at the head. And you know what? I'm looking, I can't even see the eyes. The eyes are right up front here. They have such teeny tiny little eyes. Get a little water over there. Oh, that's good. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. wow. Its head is bigger than your head. It is. I feel like my entire head could fit inside of its mouth, but that's not a place that you want to find yourself. Look at the tail. Enormous, absolutely enormous. So much power in this animal. And when I was cradling it, as it came up out of the enclosure, you could feel just how strong it truly was. Okay, so the first thing uh, we're gonna end up getting is the total length of the animal. Oh, you hear that noise that it's making? It's like a grumbling. Oh, he's gonna push that rock, push those rocks down. Okay. Okay, cool, we've kind of got him in a good position to get the total length here. Yeah. Right there? Okay. We're just gonna go with this here. We are at 49 and a half. 49 and a half is what it appears. In centimeters, that is 126 centimeters. Wow, that is a giant. Okay, so we're not gonna do the snout to vent length. It's too much to put this animal on its back to get that measurement. So the next thing we're gonna do is get the head width and also the tail height, uh, and finally its body weight. We've got some rain rolling in, so we're gonna have to do this quickly, guys. All right, I'm gonna get the tail height first. I wanna do that at the highest point, if possible. It is right at 14. 14 centimeters? 14. 21. All right, head width 21 centimeters. Absolutely dwarfs the giant that we caught in the field. All right, so the next thing to do? Body weight. Body weight. Okay, so how do we get the body weight? Uh, have to put, put it in, in container. Okay, put it inside the blue container and then put that on top of this. Okay, great. So we're putting a little bit of water inside of the container just to keep the salamander hydrated. You don't want its skin to stick to the basin. All right, so we're saying that the weight of the container with the water is 16 kilograms. We will put the salamander inside and then subtract that weight from 16. Okay, Eddie, lie down next to it real quick. Yeah, it's almost impossible to comprehend how big this thing is. You're right, unless we get something like a human next to it for scale. Look at that. All right, now this, we have to do this quickly and very gently because it's very, very slippery. So, see, as little chance for error as possible. 
here, big guy. Get too fast. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Real gentle. <laughs> For the main episode the other night when we were in the field, we had a small container. This is as big as it gets. So why is this giant salamander in captivity? Great question. Many years ago, during the building of a bridge system, its home was destroyed and the animal was accidentally injured by a piece of heavy machinery. The construction team quickly realized what they had found and immediately alerted the Hanzaki Institute. The good news is that the salamander survived. The bad news is that its home was destroyed, and as a displaced animal of this size and stature, it was decided that the great Osanchiro should be kept in captivity. So that just goes to show you guys that even if an animal like this loses an appendage, something like its, its foot or its toes, it still has the ability to survive against all odds. I mean, this is considered a national treasure right here. When you look at an animal like this and you think to yourself, wow, this has been on the planet longer than most of us. It is certainly something that needs to be preserved, that needs to be cherished and honored. And it's really cool that the salamander is now a part of the breeding program here at the Hanzaki Institute. All right, you guys ready to get the weight? Yep, let's get the weight. Okay, so hands off of the container. We've got a perfectly balanced salamander on the scale, and we are at just about 30 kilograms. Remember, we need to take 16 away from that, so 14 kilograms is the weight of this amphibian. An absolute giant. Cannot believe it. Never thought that I would see a salamander of this size. Man, so cool. All right. Cool. Do we want to look at some of its interesting characteristics? Sure. Yeah. Let's take it back down off of the scale. We've only got a couple more minutes with it, and then we got to get it back into its enclosure. Okay. All right, guys. Now the last thing we need to do is sort of just examine the salamander's features, make sure its feet and all the aspects of its body are in really good shape. So um, the first thing we're going to look at are the four feet here. The hands, look at that. Look at how big that hand is. Now, these salamanders have four toes on the front feet, and on the back feet, they have five toes. Check that out. And those digits are about as big in width as my fingers. Look at that. Holding hands with a Japanese giant salamander. Salamander is incredibly healthy. When you get down to here, you'll notice all of the muscle in this tail. It is just a solid mass of power. Look at that a large rudder that helps this animal move through the environment and also to quickly maneuver itself if it needs to escape from a predator. Now look at these flaps of skin that run along the sides of the body here. They're actually able to absorb oxygen through those flaps which helps them to breathe underwater. As we know, they also have lungs. Actually, it was just blowing some bubbles up front there. So this animal breathes through its skin? Uh, it can. They, of course, they have lungs. They do come to the surface to get a big gulp of air, but they can stay submerged for hours at a time, especially when the males are defending the den. As we know, the males are oftentimes called den masters. They protect the eggs. They protect the larva. So, Coyote, what, is the, what does it feel like? Like a big, wet, muscular slinky. Go ahead, Mark. Reach down in there. Get some water on your hands first. Right, and just give it a little pet. Feel the skin. Very dense, right? Oh, wow. A lot different than actually I imagine it being a lot slimier. It's not that slimy. Yeah, no, but they do secrete more mucus if they're feeling stressed. So it's really good. You can see the animal's completely calm at this point. Just keeping it in a little bit of water helps keep it hydrated. All right, well, I think we have collected all the necessary data, which means it is time for us to safely get this salamander back into its enclosure. All right. Oh, it never gets any easier. Salamander coming in. Got him. Got him. Good, good, good. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, got him. There he is. Ready? Yep. Okay. All right, here he goes. Wow. That was cool. 
Okada Sensei, thank you so much for giving us the chance to get up close with this national treasure. What an incredible day for the Brave Wilderness crew and a true honor to work with this salamander here in Japan. Working alongside Okada Sensei in the field and getting hands-on with Japanese giant salamanders while visiting the Hanzaki Institute was one of the most meaningful experiences the Brave Wilderness team and I have ever had. Approximately 41% of the world's amphibian species are threatened, and giant salamanders are no exception. The significance this animal holds in Japanese culture cannot be matched, and it was a true honor that we as visitors to this sacred land were entrusted with telling these stories. Over the past two years, we have produced more than 250 episodes on the Brave Wilderness Channel, and on each adventure, we do our best to get animals up close with the cameras. However, there are many animals that have eluded me over the years, including the largest frog species in Costa Rica, the smoky jungle frog. Ah! That's what happened last time. Every time the smoky jungle frog outs me! While visiting the Caribbean coast, we spent time exploring the dense rainforests of the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Preserve. This location was a prime habitat for these giant amphibians. Long night, battling rainstorms, and finally, it looks like we have a jungle frog that is not by its hole. But it is right next to a pond. If you can hear all those frogs croaking, this guy can literally leap off the embankment and into the water. My biggest challenge would be getting close enough to actually catch one. These frogs are very in tune with their environment and always have an escape route nearby that allows them to quickly avoid predators. Oh, oh. hold on. Jeez, all right, I'm out of here. Coming up. Ah, yeah, well. Catching smoky jungle frogs is about the hardest thing I've faced in quite some time here in Costa Rica. But do not fear, I will catch one. Oh, this is We continued searching into the night and traveled deeper into the jungle where we came upon a swampy lagoon. We do have another smoky jungle frog up here on the embankment. It is uh, definitely gonna be way more difficult to catch than even the last one. Let's move up slow with the lights. Let me see if I can give you a shot on him, Mark. He is, look at the eye shine up there underneath that branch, you see it? Where? Up underneath, like go, see this skinny log across the thick log, look straight up from that on the embankment. See it dark right there? No. Oh yeah, 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 there he is, he's right behind the leaf. Smoky jungle frog right there. Okay, Here, we need to get out of this pond and into a controlled situation. Oh, what a slimy beast. Wow, okay, um, let's get this guy out of the pond and up onto the trail. I give you a high five, except my hand is covered in frog mucus. I appreciate that. Yes! All right. Wow, what a catch. Nice grab, man. Finally, yes! I'm not sure we could have gotten that one any better. What a grab. Oh. I'm rolling. There it is. The famous sound that they make. Wow. <laughs> that is the alarm sound that we were home. Oh, I hear you. They are famous for making that loud croaking alarm sound. You hear that? Now, if you were a predator, you came in here and you grabbed a hold of this frog and it did that. That. It would be startling, and you would likely drop the frog, and it would escape. I, I hear you. Yes. 
Wow, the vocal cords on that frog are incredible. Now, a secondary defense is you see all this mucus that is coming off of the frog's body. That is slightly toxic and it is actually burning really bad on my fingers right now. I have a couple of cuts. You can see it looks like foam. Now that mucus not only keeps the frog moist, but it also deters any potential predators. Oh, I knew, I hear you little buddy. Now I'm not hurting the frog in any way whatsoever. You see it's puffing up its body. He's like a balloon right now. Yes, I know, but you have, have you not figured out that you've already been captured? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but Oh, I'm so excited we caught this frog. Now, they are incredibly strong. These back legs are solid muscle. Now, Mark, look at this frog's toes. What is it missing? Webbing? That's right, because this is a terrestrial species. Now, they're oftentimes living in burrows, and that is what these frogs have been escaping into all night, or up underneath root cavities. But this one was right on the edge of a pond, likely hunting, because they are ambush predators. And no wonder, look at how big it is. Wow, you are just a beast. Oh, it's incredible. Now, all amphibians have toxins in their skin. I've handled many amphibians on this trip to Costa Rica, but nothing has actually made my hands burn yet. And all of that foam and all the little small cuts on my fingers is stinging really, really bad right now. So I won't be able to hold on to the frog for too long, but what? amazing coloration. Now, you can see how this frog looks just like the leaf litter. So if it was kind of down here on the ground, just hiding underneath things amongst the leaves. Now, during the day, they will do that. Just stay hidden on the forest floor. And you can see that very distinct camouflage on the back looks exactly like the cutouts in some of these leaves and the ferns. And if you lift the frog up, hit that little piece. Oh! Oh, he's squeezing me with those front arms. They're, oh, 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 oh. oh I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. Oh. Man, he's slippery, isn't he? <sighs> Unbelievably slippery. Well, all oh, that man, mucus. Money yeah. <laughs> oh, I wasn't gonna let this one get away. <laughs> this frog is definitely making us, oh, I'm sorry, but you got mud on your face. You got mud on your face, it's okay. Here, hold on a second, I've got a Yeah, you got, got a bottle of water. water. Here we go, a little drink, there we go. I'm covered in mud too, this probably isn't helping, but I want you guys to be able to see the beautiful camouflage of this frog's face. They are absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of like a giant wood frog. There we go. It has gold in it. It's you, yes. Look at the eyes, amber and gold. Beautiful, look at that. Okay, hold on just a second longer. Now, I do believe this is a male because you can see on the fingers here, they have these little hooks and that helps them to hold on to the females during the breeding process. And actually during breeding season, the male's forearms get significantly bigger and one of their defense postures uh, and to defend their territories because they're very territorial, they will puff up their bodies, push their arms out like big bodybuilders and then defend their territory from other impressing males. Now here's something that's really interesting about the tadpoles of these frogs. Now they lay their nests in like a giant clump of foam and as the tadpoles are developing, the ones that grow quicker end up eating the smaller ones. So in a sense, this frog is a cannibal. Buddy, you eat your own kind, that's kind of crazy. Wow, <laughs> oh man, what a catch. And a second catch diving right there into the mud. Can you show us the legs? Oh, oh that's a risky game, but let me see what I can do here. Yeah, I like to see the, uh, do the not stripes. I want to lose the frog. Oh, 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 he's very slippery. Now, the mucus that he's secreting makes him even more slippery. That's that's about as far as I can show you right okay, there. Okay, cool. Does that help? Yeah. It really looks like tiger stripes. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Now, this is the largest frog species here in Costa Rica. They do get a bit bigger than this, but as compared to the ones we've seen tonight, this is an absolute giant. Look at that frog. Wow. What a night. It took us hours, but we finally managed to catch the one amphibian that has been eluding me every time I've been in Costa Rica, the smoky jungle frog. Ow, ow. Oh, he's saying goodbye. I think he's ready to go. We're gonna set him down right here and he's gonna plop all the way back down into the water. Oh, <laughs> did you see that distance? Jump. That was awesome. What a night. On this episode of Coyote's Backyard, we will be heading out to explore a place that I consider my childhood backyard, the Holden Arboretum. 
Established in 1931, this wild place spans 3,600 acres in northeastern Ohio and is home to a wide variety of plants and animals. When I was a kid, I spent my summer searching this location for frogs, snakes, and turtles. So today I will be taking a trip down memory lane as I lead members of the coyote pack around the grounds to search for wildlife. So if I put up these ears, if I get signal guys like this, it means I've seen something everybody be this? super. Oh, I guess that works. Do you want to do that? Oh, that kind of looks a little coyote. bit more I like, like that. that. Uh, <sighs> That's so smart. What's your name? Rigsby. Rigsby? Mm -hmm. Rigsby decided that this is going to oh, be like the coyote that. symbol. I like it. Here, give me like a, a coyote. Boop. Okay, so this will be the coyote symbol today, which means be quiet, something's been seen. And that's be quiet and like everybody be so quiet. Let's even catch animals. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's sneak up. You guys got your maps? Yeah. Coyote, what are we doing? I don't hold my map anymore. All right, so right now we are sneaking up on the Lotus Pond, which is our first spot where we're going to actually start looking for animals. Everybody's excited. Now there are snapping turtles, snakes, and frogs that live here. It's just a matter of can we catch one. Okay, let's bring it back here into the shade a little bit. Nice. The good news is that we have caught our first animal. Yeah. But he's just a little tiny frog, right? We want to see a really big bullfrog, That's don't we? The bad news. What, that it's a little tiny one? Well, all frogs are pretty much created equal, and he is pretty cute, isn't he? Yeah. So, you guys know what kind of frog this is? Bullfrog! A bullfrog, that's right. That's a good little one. It's nice to see these little tiny frogs like this, because it means the ecosystem is incredibly healthy, and the tadpoles are turning into frogs. Now, a frog of this size, it's got a lot of predators out there. You guys know what would eat a frog like this? Snapping <laughs> Snapping turtle, not a coyote, right? Not a snake. A snake could eat a frog like this, yep. And he's probably thinking to himself right now, uh-oh, look at all these coyote pack members. Is anybody, you wouldn't eat this frog, would you? You want to pat him? Just real gently on his back right there? I want to no? pet him. I want to pet him. I want to pet him. Okay, back, stay right. back. Now frogs are totally safe to catch and pet. All right, well, hopefully we'll catch a bigger one, but this is a good start. So far, we are one for one. Watch how he swims off. You guys ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Bye, buddy. Boop. <laughs> hey, there he is. Bye, Did buddy. he swim down hiding the leaves? Yeah. yeah. I saw All right. Well, we caught a frog. Should we go back? Let's call it a day. Well, this is the part where somebody should give you a high five. Oh, yeah. Who wants a high five? High five. Boom, 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 boom. High fives all the way high around. High fives. High, high fives. High fives. All right, let's go find something a little crazy. you stand up in the right place at the right time. That's a pretty good sized Midland painted turtle right there. And this time of day, the turtles are just basking up on top of these weed beds absorbing light. And I see the back of the carapace here. All of that space right there is kind of like a solar panel, right? They're relying on the sun to heat them up so that they can go out and hunt. Now, this turtle does have some algae on its shell. Oftentimes, you don't see painted turtles with algae on the shells because they spend so much time basking in the sun. The sun kills the algae, and then their shell is usually very smooth. But you, for some reason, because you probably live in this real mucky area, have gotten a lot of algae on you. What do you guys want to name this one? I know. What? Oh, Picasso, because he's a painted. Oh, okay. You guys want to go with Picasso? Yeah. Yes. Every once in a while, you got to give one to Mario, otherwise he'll cry. <laughs> That's the only one, Mario. All right. You guys ready to let Picasso go? Yeah. All right. Mark, you got your shots? I did. All right. I'm going to just put Picasso out here in the... I want to get that snapping turtle. I see a snapping turtle. I sure, certainly do. Okay. It's 100% a snapping turtle on the far side of the pond. You guys can't see it from here. It's by those 
by those green plants, man. Catchable? Yeah, definitely is. It's faced, it's faced in the wrong direction. I mean, there's no way to make a play on it when it's up like that. So we're gonna ignore it for the moment, but we are gonna go around this side. The good thing about where it's positioned is we're not gonna disturb it on that side and there's no people walking over there. So right here by these rocks, there are a lot of water snakes. So that's gonna be our immediate target. Now, good news is that I see snapping turtle. There's potential for snapping turtles all throughout this pond. There's about four of them that live in here. The good news is that we see one, right? You do not see a snapping turtle. I do see a snapping turtle. 100% see a snapping turtle. What I'm gonna do is have you guys wait right here. Mario's gonna go with me, and I'm gonna sneak up right by these rocks here and see if I can get us a water snake. That's a turkey vulture. Everybody stay back, everybody stay back. Ah, he's biting me! Oh, yes he did. Not everybody. This, this is dangerous, so we're not gonna pet this one. It's very feisty. As you can see, I'm already bleeding. That is a northern water snake. You don't normally want to jump on rocks to catch snakes, but today, we definitely need to see the animals, right? And that didn't take me long, did it? Now let me teach you guys a little something about water snakes. They bite, right? Now notice the pattern of this snake. The pattern is very distinct. You see that? See that speckle patterning? That kind of looks like a water moccasin, kind of looks like a copperhead. People oftentimes misidentify the northern water snake for one of those venomous species. However, this is non-venomous, but they do bite. Now, why am I bleeding as much as I am? It's not because they have big teeth, it's because they have an anticoagulant in their saliva. Has anybody ever heard that term? Yeah. Anticoagulant? Yeah. Basically, it causes you to bleed a lot and the blood doesn't clot, right? So it doesn't kind of stop bleeding. So this is just gonna keep dripping. See that, Mark? Yeah, yeah. and you know what else he's doing? Oof. No, no biting, no biting. He's also musky. Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, he tried to get you there. Oh, close to the camera. All right, you guys ready to put the snake back? Oh, he's trying to get my nose. You guys ready to get the snake back out in the wild? Yeah. Yeah, he is bitey. All right, here we go. I'm gonna let him go right back where he came from. All right, I'm gonna set him down. Bye, buddy. All right, so Coyote, what are we doing? All right, I'm scanning this edge for snapping turtles. It's dark and shady right here, so it's really tough to see into the water. These geese are moving out, which is good. It means it won't scare the snapping turtle once we get over there. If the geese are acting natural, it means that the environment is natural and that hopefully we can land a dragon. All right, everybody hang out here in the shade. Where is he? Okay, the snapping turtle's off this edge here. I think he went deeper but I'm gonna sneak up on this edge just to see if I see something. I'm gonna move all along the edge of this, so you guys stay here with Mark. Okay, or Mark, you coming with me? I'm coming with you. Okay, Mark's coming with me. Everybody stay right here. right there. Man, he almost slipped out of my hands. He is so slimy. Ah. Woo! Now, before anybody gets any closer, I'm gonna sit down for a second. There we got one, right? Let's not get bitten by it, especially me. Now, this is noseless. I don't know if you can see from there, but he doesn't have a nose. Something happened to him early on in life, probably fighting with another turtle. But as you can see, they're very, very snappy, right? So you see where Mark is? You guys can get to about where Mark is. Don't anybody get any closer because the turtle's head is facing that direction. Okay, right there. Good, 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 good. Perfect. Awesome, guys. Now, we can pet the snapping turtle at the very end. I will turn it backwards and one at a time, we can come up and pet its tail, okay? Now, noseless is one of the most consistent common snapping turtles that I have caught here at the Holden Arboretum always seems to be hunting around the edges of Heath Pond. And 
I still think you're incredibly handsome even though you don't have a nose because it makes you very, very unique looking. It makes you very easy to identify. Now, at, can we, just for like two seconds, can we be calm? Everybody's here, they want to see you. You know we go through this once a year. Once a year. See, he's smiling for you guys, but he would really like to bite me. So this is a common snapping turtle of about average size, right? For me to catch a turtle of this size, I'm really excited about it, right? But what would be even more exciting is a super enormous turtle. But this looks pretty big to you guys, right? Yeah. That's a pretty big turtle. Now, can we think of any predators for a snapping turtle of this size? What would eat a turtle of this size? Uh, okay. What do you think? Maybe an alligator? Oh, come on. Maybe, but there's no alligator snapping turtles around here. The honest answer is only humans. Did you guys know that people make turtle soup sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no turtle soup for you. No soup for you, buddy. Don't worry about it. You're totally good. A turtle of this size really doesn't have any predators. Now, when they're smaller, baby common snapping turtles are just a little bit bigger than that. So a turtle of that size could be eaten by a bird or a larger turtle or a snake or even like a largemouth bass. You guys know what bass are, right? Yeah. All right, Mark, can you kind of see his tail from there? Yep. All right, let me kind of turn like that. You guys see that dragon looking tail? Yeah. I have to keep a good eye on the front end. Now one thing that I love about these turtles' tails is I'm gonna kinda really delicately, okay, no nose, noseless. Hey, buddy, I'm gonna let go with that hand. Don't you try to spin and bite me. We're gonna look at your tail. Check out those ridges. These are osteoderms, which are pieces of bone covered in skin, scale, and at this point, some really gnarly looking algae. Look at that, looks just like the tail of a dragon. Let's look at the plastron of the snapping turtle, right? We're bringing him up. Take a good look at that, guys. Okay, there we go. I see it, I see it, I see it. Okay, there we go. All right, you see that? Now, the plastron of the common snapping turtle is much smaller than other turtle species, and that's why they have evolved to have this very gnarled skin, sharp claws, and that powerful bite. Woo! All right, hold on one second, guys. Let's get a little wrap up here, and then everybody can pet Noseless's tail. How's that sound? Well, I would definitely say that that was one epic adventure. We caught all sorts of creatures, and in the end, landed one enormous common snapping turtle. You guys ready to let this turtle go? Yeah! All right! Say thanks, Noseless! Thank you! Bye-bye, Noseless. Bye, Noseless. Bye, Noseless. Woo! Nice. All right. The Holden Arboretum is a location that is truly near and dear to my heart and I visit every chance that I get. Their continued preservation of the natural world has defined them as one of the top locations in the United States to enjoy both plants and native animals. For me, being given the opportunity to lead members of the Coyote Pack around Holden Arboretum was like being a kid again. And I hope moving into the future that these young adventurers and animal enthusiasts will help carry on my love and excitement for this very special place. Over the years, we have featured a plethora of frog species. Some of them were tiny and poisonous. Some of them jumped on my face. Some of them were giant and screamy. There it is, the famous sound that they meow, make. Meow, meow, meow. Wow. And some of them were even semi-transparent. The point, is that I was able to safely catch and successfully get them up close for the cameras so we could learn about what makes them so unique. But what if I told you that there was a frog that was impossible to catch and was also blue? <coughs> Hold up, a blue frog? Yes, you heard me right, a blue frog. This encounter happened on the island of Middle Bass, located in Lake Erie. The following series of events will play out in chronological order. Prepare yourselves because you are about to witness the unbelievable. Oh my gosh. What? Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. I've actually read about this before. This is insanely rare. Every once in a while, based on limitations within genetic dynamics, a frog will sometimes lose pigmentation through its genetic line and will be blue in coloration. I mean, we are talking about a literal unicorn right here. This is crazy. Oh, he moved. There he is, there he is. I still see him. Oh, he 
can't he can't make it through there. Oh whoa. Oh 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 yes, yes. Maybe he'll come back this way. Still see him? No. Dude, that was crazy. That was crazy. Okay, hold on, I'm coming back to you. I think we need to come back at night. If we come back at night and we see that frog, I can spot mm. it with a flashlight and I don't think it'll jump. I couldn't even get close. Okay. If we can catch that frog. Holy cow, that will be insane. A blue frog. I cannot believe what I just saw. If he comes back out at night, we're definitely gonna get him. Let's do it. So how do you catch the uncatchable frog? I'm gonna build a contraption. Well, when I chased after this frog, the first thing it did was hop across all the duckweed and disappear back Whoa. and into the swamp. And I've got this long wooden beam and I'm going to secure my net to the beam. If I don't have to touch the water, even better. Now bullfrogs have a tendency to breed pretty territorial. So I think even though the fact that I chased it back into the marsh, it's still going to return to that spot to defend its little claim right there. That is good and secure and will give me several more feet of reach. All right guys, this is it. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay guys, sun has set. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay, it's just down the way here. Let's uh, sneak up and see if it's back in its spot. There he is. Okay. Right there, and he's way closer to me. Oh, shoot. Okay, this frog is definitely tough to catch. Definitely knows what we're on to him. Oh, don't do it by hand. It's gonna be slippy. Use the net, put it right under him. Oh. Okay, okay, he could go from behind. Hang on, let me get the light on him. There he goes, there he goes, right there, right there, right there. He's, he's going. Still there. Still there. I gotta go on the other side of my fence. Okay. I think we're gonna get him. The length of the net is now actually hurting me. Oh, 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 oh. I see him. No. No. Dang it. Gosh, he's way back in there. Did we lose him? I lost him. <sighs> Dang it! It was literally inches from my hand right here. I should have gone for the hand catch, man. I should have gone for the hand catch. Dude, he's all the way back here in those reeds. I can't get him. Oh, but, but, here's the thing. We tried to catch him in daylight. He went all the way back there and came all the way right back to this spot. There's a good chance this frog will be back. I think I gotta catch him by hand. He's too smart for the net. This frog knows exactly what is happening. He's impossible to catch. Man. This is crazy, absolutely crazy. Okay, this is day two. We are back to the spot where the blue bullfrog was spotted yesterday. And this morning it has returned to its territory, which certainly proves my theory that this frog is running this little pocket of water. Now, I can see the frog. I'm not going to try to catch it during daylight. It is way too smart. This may be the smartest frog I've ever encountered. I mean, it was playing cat and mouse with me last night. It was just a game. It led me back into the reeds. I got bitten up by mosquitoes. It was rough. I've never had a more difficult struggle catching a frog. So what we're gonna do is wait until sun gets low in the sky again, just at sunset, when this frog is back in the spot, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna take another attempt. I will attempt with the net at first, but if it gets close, gotta use my hand. Last night, the frog was literally about a foot and a half away from me, and I defaulted to the net. I should have gone with my gut and tried to catch it with my hand, and I might have had it, but we're gonna give it one more shot tonight. Okay, here we go. The third attempt at catching the blue bullfrog. And what I've done tonight is brought a smaller net plus the long extended net. 
gotta up our chances. And if it's not with the net, it's going to be with my hand. Yes, that's him, that's him, that's him. You ready? Yep. You got him. You got him. Oh, whoa, 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 no. Oh, no. 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 What? No. Oh, my gosh. Dude, you had him. Hold on. Let's rewind and slow it down. Look at the evasive maneuver this frog pulls off as it springs from inside the net and does a full nosedive back into the water and disappears beneath the duckweed. Now look at this. Freeze frame. Zoom in. My hand is less than an inch away from making a swooping and unbelievable catch. But I missed it. Ah, oh, it was so close. Dude, I had him. Give I know, I saw him. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that just happened. There's nothing more frustrating than literally having the frog you've been trying to catch for three days in your net and then have it spring out just as I was trying to get my hand in there to keep him locked in position. Oh, don't got him yet. We're going to keep trying. Is it day three? Day three. Attempt number four. four? Mm -hmm. Official attempt number four. The blue frog is back. And walk over to the car and get the net. Do you guys believe in miracles? Is it possible to catch a blue frog? We're about to find out. This is it. It is our last day. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, it's already on to us. And that's it. There he goes. All the way back. I don't think we even had a chance. I literally wasn't even able to set foot in the water. The legend of the blue frog. That's it. The blue frog is officially uncatchable. There is a frog that is not capable of being caught by Coyote Peterson. Well, maybe we'll have to return to Middle Bass Island at some point to see if the blue frog still manages to evade capture. The legend of the blue frog persists. Will we catch Bluey on our next adventure? Stay tuned. You're my boy, Blue. You're my boy. What's going on, guys? OK, so in the saga of the blue frog, which I know many of you have seen that episode, I am back on Middle Bass Island. Now, I'm completely unprepared, no camera team, no nothing, but I came out and just for the heck of it decided to see if I could find the blue frog. I did not find the one that you guys saw on the previous trip, but I found this frog, which also looks like it may be some sort of genetic abnormality. It has crazy blue coloration and lighter green speckling. What we're gonna do is hold on to the frog until daylight so we can get a better look at it. <laughs> this is awesome. In the summer of 2020, I came upon a sight I never expected to see. Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. For three days, Mario and I pursued this frog. Day and night, we attempted to catch and share this beautiful blue beauty with the coyote pack. Yet this super spring-loaded creature outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and outplayed me like no frog I had ever been witness to. Coyote Peterson was truly defeated by a blue frog. I can't believe that just happened. I returned to the scene of my defeat several times in the following weeks, but the blue frog was nowhere to be found. The Phantom of Middle Bass had disappeared and the legend was born. Then on a random trip back to the island, 
without any expectation of seeing this legendary frog, and with no proper camera team, a new blue was spotted. And I totally redeem myself. Okay guys, so here's what's happened. Last night, I was out investigating the same swamp where I had seen a bullfrog once before, a blue bullfrog. You may remember an episode from a few weeks ago called Blue Frog Must See It to Believe It. Well, I didn't anticipate seeing that frog again considering I had scouted one other time. I was back last night and lo and behold, I found a different blue frog. No, this is not the same blue frog that evaded capture last time. This is another example of a frog that has gone through a color mutation. Now, it's not so much why is this frog blue, it's how did this frog become blue? It is blue because it has a color mutation known as a xanthism. Think of it like this. If you're mixing colors together, blue and yellow make green. The base layer of bullfrogs is actually blue, but this frog lacks a yellow pigmentation in its skin. If the base is blue and the second layer is yellow, when those mix together, that is why we perceive frogs as being green. This frog has a lack of that yellow pigmentation, which is what makes it appear to be sapphire. Now, a color abnormality like this can be rather frequent in nature, and it happens quite often in different amphibian species, not only in frogs, but also in salamanders. Although scientists predict that finding a blue bullfrog is about one in 30,000 frogs. So I definitely consider this quite the anomaly and a pretty incredible find. Uh, the reason that I'm guessing that there is genetic mutation happening here on Middle Bass Island is because this is a very isolated population of bullfrogs. There are very few predators other than herons and snapping turtles in this environment, which is allowing these frogs to just continuously reproduce. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bullfrogs living in this marsh. So after a while, it's not unlikely that there's going to be some sort of mutation that happens where you have a color variation like like this. I think we all remember the sapphire crayfish, and I think it would be uh, rather fitting to call this the sapphire bullfrog, but just so we're clear, this is not a new species. It is a true bullfrog, it just has a color mutation. Uh, the more this frog is out in the sun, warming itself up for the day, the brighter that blue color is going to get. When this amphibian is cold or it's hunkered down, they have the ability to shift the chromatophores in their skin, which of course can help keep them more camouflaged. Now the problem a blue frog like this faces is that it cannot camouflage properly. I'm actually really pleased to see that the frog has grown to this size to begin with. A lot of animals that do not have the proper coloration for their environment end up being easily predated upon by other predators. Now, the way that I caught this frog, which actually happened off camera, is I did shine it with a flashlight, but it wasn't in the water, it was actually up on land. I used the long extendable net, got the net over top of the frog, it was able to quickly pounce on top of it and get it scooped up. What I want to do now is give you guys an up close comparison between the blue bullfrog and a normal green bullfrog. Now, these are the exact same species, about the same size, but you'll notice how different looking the blue mutation is from the green one. Let's start with the eyes. The eyes of the green bullfrog are bright amber in coloration surrounding that black pupil, but the blue bullfrog's eyes are almost completely black and brown. That again has to do with the lack of yellow pigmentation in this frog's body. When it comes to camouflage, there's no question about it. The green frog is gonna blend in much better within a swamp or marsh environment with lily pads and duckweed. The blue bullfrog, especially when you turn it sideways like this, you can see is so much more likely to stand out amongst a green environment. My theory on that as to why I was unable to catch the blue bullfrog last time is that they're more agile and more in tune with any movements within the environment. The second they feel the water shifting or a difference between light and shadows, they immediately think, oh no, I'm no longer hidden, something's getting close, it may eat me, I better spring off into action and find myself a better hiding spot. I wonder if they're talking, saying to themselves, what are we doing right now? Are we being filmed? Were we abducted by aliens? Are we about to be famous on YouTube? Without question, this blue bullfrog is probably going to be the most famous frog we have ever filmed. Well, it's taken me several trips back to Middle Bass Island, but I was finally able to find and successfully catch the one and only blue bullfrog. All right, time to get these two hoppers back off into the swamp. A quick search of the internet will reveal that several blue frogs have shown up in 2020, 
including specimens sighted in Texas, Indiana, Louisiana, Iowa, and of course, Ohio. Some say these frogs are one in a million, which is probably pretty accurate considering the number of tadpoles that hatch out and grow into frogs every season. Yet while it is rarely witnessed due to the elusive nature of most amphibians, azanathism is relatively widespread in salamander and frog populations that have a limited gene pool, like frogs isolated to an island. For me, the summer of 2020 will always carry with it the memory of the blue frog. And if you ever get the chance to visit Middle Bass Island and find yourself walking along the marsh, who knows, maybe you too will be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the sapphire bullfrog. Thank <laughs> you.